Hi, I'm Rebecca Holden, and I am here on behalf of the National Fiddler Hall of Fame. And I am sitting here with a very talented Bobby Bruce, who is going to be inducted into the Hall of Fame this March 27th in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Hi, so, I'm flabbergasted. <laughs> so thank you so much for having us here today oh, and allowing us pleasure. this opportunity to talk about your very remarkable career. Oh my goodness, I wouldn't know where to begin. Well, why don't we begin at the very beginning? Do you remember the very, very first time that you held a fiddle? I think I was listening to the radio. They didn't have TV in those days. Mm -hmm. I was listening to the radio, and I think I heard a violin. And I got over closer to the radio, and I listened to that, and I turned to my mama. And I said, I love that. And it just fascinated the heck out of me. So I think that was the first time I was about six. Do you remember the first time you picked one up? I was still six. Mm -hmm. Well, you started out your career very early in yeah, show business, very didn't early. you? Yeah, I my mom and my sister and I, child. we had an act called the Personality Kids. And we grew up doing vaudeville. Vaudeville is where, for the people that doesn't know, uh, it's where they have acts in between doing a film or a couple of films in a theater. They would have acts of vaudeville. It could be a tap dancer, a magician, a chanteuse that sits on the piano and pulls her scarf up, uh, any kind of a, a dancing act, and something from another country. And as a kid, I would be backstage having these people preempt me and it would soak in like a sponge on a six or seven or eight or ten, mm -hmm. ten year old. And uh, which really helped me down the road as far as making up things as you go along in cartoon work, which I got into later. It turned out to be a blessing. Your mother was in your act, wasn't yeah, she? Yes, she used to tell funny stories and tap dance. So it was a real family affair. And she used to put her hair up and she had long red hair down to her tail. Uh -huh. And uh, she used to stuff it up underneath the cap and black out some teeth. And we'd tell funny stories and do some kind of a country dance type of thing, uh -huh. you know. And I had the fiddle and my sister played piano. A real family affair. Yeah, and, yeah. I, and acrobatics. and. I had an act where uh, I had to drink a glass of water, colored water, with tape around the edge on a, on a high little uh, stand and do a back bend. I, I think I was singing Brother Can You Spare a Dime or something like that. It was during the Depression. And uh, I was playing the fiddle and going backwards and at the same time brought the house down. <laughs> I bet you that did. Was, that was the closing act for us. Well, you started out really early as a child. And, and I remember you, they said, don't ever follow an animal act with anything but a shovel. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah. Well, you grew up in Chicago, didn't you? Yes. And, and Chicago is really a jazz town. So oh, yeah. So is that when you first learned to love jazz? Well, I was studying at the Chicago Musical College on a scholarship as a kid. Studying classical violin, yeah, right? Yeah, classical. All so you had the classical training and, and the background. Yeah, more or less I did. Mm -hmm. Really, I had one of the finest teachers. His name was Leon Samantini. And in the 30s, he used to charge, I think it was $35 a half hour. And that was a fortune because you could, get, of you could get a week's worth of groceries for five bucks. It's the truth. <laughs> And, well, uh, your, your parents must have really sacrificed they to, did. to give you lessons. So like when I'd come home on a streetcar, uh, I'd have to go through the colored neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I would hear jazz music coming and it fascinated me. And I'd get out and finally one day in a driving rainstorm, I'm standing there with my fiddle case under my arm listening and getting soaking wet and they said come on in boy you, you can't stand out there and get soaked <laughs> so i came in and i finally had guts enough to get up there and try to fake along and that's where, I, where it all began it was such a fascinating adventure
That's marvelous. And you then know, you started playing in the local and I jazz started club playing in, in clubs and jazz, learning all the pop tunes and stuff like that. Because your career has been very diverse, all genres of music. Yeah, country, western, mm -hmm. swing, swing, jazz, out and out, good blues. What were the fiddlers that most influenced you in your early Stuff years? Smith. Really? Stuff Smith. He was the pioneer for, uh, they used to talk about others, but Stuff, I think he had such a drive and uh when did you first hear him oh, on radio to, yes mm -hmm. then did you get to meet him in person i never did but i got to contribute a pint of blood for him when he was ill out here on the west coast uh before he died oh at least i contributed a pint of blood for him how nice was that oh, yeah he was he your was, hero yes yeah i loved the his men his work it was just wonderful. I understand that when World War II yeah. rolled around, you enlisted in the, in the Marines. Marines. Yes. And I understand that you carried your fiddle into battle with you. I did, and I got a write-up on the Chicago, uh, was it the Chicago Herald Examiner, I believe? What happened was that during a lull, uh -huh. they had what they called like a soup kitchen what it was was a big hole in the sand and a tarp over the top and you slid down into it. I had my fiddle with, with a rope around it on my back and I slid down there after a, we, we had had a little bit of a break from the battle. And uh, I pulled the fiddle out and they had a choice of soup or coffee. And I remember I had some uh, soup. And I was sitting there and I had that soup and it tasted so good. And it felt like such a relief to get away. And I pulled the fiddle out and I started to play. And the fellow sitting next to me turned out to be a newspaper man. And he said, where are you from? I said, Chicago. And he says, I'll see that the Herald Examiner, what's your name? And my legal name is Robert Berg, B-E-R-G. And I gave him my legal name and uh, he gave me a write-up in the paper, said this Marine was playing a violin. It was wonderful. It just took you right away from everything. And my mom got to see it in Chicago. And that pleased me so much. That must have made her so proud Oh, of you. It, was, it was. Because you were really um, soothing the, the troops in, yes. in that stress of, of battle and oh, war. Oh, it was terrible. I, I don't want to tell you any of those stories. Because you served in some pretty historic battles. You were at Iwo Jima, weren't you? Yes, I was on Iwo Jima and I was on uh, Guam. Guam? Uh -huh. Saipan and Tinian. Well, the, the other soldiers... Iwo was the big one, though. Yeah. That was... And, and you we... played in the foxholes, too. I oh, yeah. Oh, you sure. heard about that. I did hear about that. Yeah, right outside of our cots in the tents, mm -hmm. we had to dig a foxhole so you could fall down in in case there was a, a bombing attack. And uh, it got to be old hat that there was a there was a plane that used to come over Guadalcanal, and he was called Wash Machine Charlie, and uh, he'd just come over and he'd drop these little twenty five pound anti personnel bombs, but it was just for a, being a pest more than anything else. So when he came over on his usual route. Everybody say, condition red, and then you have to roll out of your cot and roll into your foxhole. Well, I had the fiddle with me, so I sat on the end of my foxhole there, and I was playing, and a brand new shaved tail lieutenant that just come over mm -hmm. says, hey, shut up, you're making too much noise, I can't hear the airplanes coming in. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a fiddle playing. Oh. Uh, I've been, most of people were very, very grateful to have you there. Oh, yeah. Because I understand you got a nickname, the Fighting Fiddler of World War II. <laughs> Do you remember who, who gave that He's called me the you? Fighting Hebe. <laughs> yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, my. The Fighting Hebe. Yeah. That's, that's good. When you were in the Pacific. Yes. How was that tropical weather on a fiddle? Oh, it was rough. I had to use I a baseball. It. Really? Yes, because mine fell apart in the uh, inclement weather. The, a violin bow just 
was too fragile for that kind of rainstorms and uh, uh, terrible weather they had there. I, I hope that wasn't a, a fiddle that you really cherished that no, you took there. No, it was. It was just, it was my B-flat fiddle, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. So then after the war, what happened? I think you ended up in Oklahoma? Yeah, well, let me see. Let me think. No, first I went with Luke Wills and his Rhythm Busters. Uh -huh. That's Bob Wills' brother. Uh huh. And I went to Fresno. Fresno, California. Yes, and uh -huh. we played the San Joaquin Valley. And the McClatchy Broadcasting Company was there. How did you like being on the road? Oh, I didn't mind. We had full of jokes all the time. The camaraderie of the Oh, band. the camaraderie was great. The music was pretty damn good. Yeah? Yeah. And did you like playing Western Swing? I loved it. Yeah? I did all the writing for Leon's band after I got to Oklahoma. Uh huh. And but uh, with Luke Wills, you were in California. Yeah, I didn't. I just whatever they were doing, I'd fall into. And, and you had a we pretty had a grueling schedule, didn't you? Didn't you do some radio shows in the morning? And yeah, we had one at six in the morning. So that when we came in from let's say Bakersfield into Fresno, it's 125 miles. You work till. Two, one thirty-two, and then you have to drive 125 miles, and we had a 6 a.m. broadcast, so we'd pull in in our stress job, our our, our limo, and uh, sleep in the parking lot for an hour or two, and then get up and use toothpicks to keep our eyes open. You know, <laughs> that must have been hard. Playing and the announcer the had such vigor. His name is Johnny something. I can't remember. He'd say, it's the music of Luke Wills and his Rhythm Busters. <laughs> With such vigor at six in the morning, my God. So what brought you back to Tulsa? Um, I guess Leon heard about me, uh -huh. some way, word of mouth. Mm -hmm. And he called me and says, I got a good gig for you and it's a good band. And it sounded lovely. So I just made the drive from California to Tulsa. And became an Okie. And I gotta tell you one story that happened. Please do. When I joined Luke. <laughs> it's a cute, true story. See, I'm from Chicago originally, and I'm not a country boy. And when I drove into Fresno to join Luke Wills, they had had a breakfast waiting for me. We had driven all night. Mm -hmm. My wife and I, my new wife oh. at the time. Uh -huh. And uh, so they had this breakfast and they had um, homemade biscuits and uh, pan gravy. Mm -hmm. And they make it out of bacon, I guess, mm -hmm. don't they? Mm -hmm. Bacon gravy. And it looked like, I, I thought it was a uh, cream of wheat. <gasps> so I brought the whole gravy well, boat over to me. They look kind of alike. Yeah, they, they do. They look very much alike. I, I brought the whole gravy boat over in front of me, started putting sugar in it, you know, <laughs> figuring it was cream of wheat. <laughs> that was such a terrible mistake. But being a city boy, I just didn't know country manners. Yeah, you just and needed I to, had get to learn. indoctrinated a little yes. bit. Yes. Yeah, and we country people have, have some slogans too. Yeah. That are kind of funny. I remember a barber when I first hit Tulsa. I asked about some directions or something like that. I said, where's, where's such and such place? And he, he said, instead of saying, see you later, he'd say, come back. And he said, he said, come back. And I came right back to him. <laughs> like, what do you want? <laughs> it makes just, sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. People say things like that that you're not used to if you're, if you're not from the country. I had to learn a lot. What was Tulsa like back in those days? Oh, Today is the, was the location of the Hall of Fame. I'll tell you, people back there are so darned honest. I love them because if they didn't like you, you'd know it right away. If they did like you, you'd know it right away. Uh, that's nice. They, they were just so... And they said, you gotta come over and have some chicken. <laughs> you know, fried chicken. That's good. <laughs> that was a big thing. So you enjoyed playing with Leon McCollum? I loved it. I loved it. Good guy. Oh, great, great guys. Great guys. What is the difference between 
Bob Wills and Leon McAuliffe. They're both Western swing, but what's the difference in their music? I think that they used a little bit more modern chords in Leon McCall's, like a sleep, a sleep at the Wheel fashioned itself after Leon's band. They'd use uh, uh, more involved chords, like uh, a flat five or uh, a flat nine chord. They, they would use more interesting chords in it. Bob Wills was strictly from the 30s type of, he had a banjo with a heavy two and four beat on mm -hmm. it. Chick, 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 you know. But it swung like a son of a gun. <laughs> it was very good. I love all that music anyhow. They, I can't say I'm prejudiced about one or the other because it's all good. It's all good if it's done well, you know. Now if you go in a club today and you hear say a young musician copying some of the solos you did back then. Oh my goodness. Is that a compliment to you? Are you flattered by that? Oh my God, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm flabbergasted. I would think so. <laughs> That's it's quite a tribute. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what brought that on. <laughs> uh, so what took you to California? Uh, my folks were still alive and I wanted to have a little bit of time because I was having a family. Sure. I had uh, a daughter. She was six months old. And uh, we came back out to the West Coast. So your priorities were in the right place. Yes. And uh, with the background that I'd had, it was rather involved. I got into cartoon right away. Well, I your got talent into studio. allowed you to keep working. My reading No matter was, where you were. It, I'll tell you one thing, in the studios you have to read well. Mm -hmm. You really well, there, do. There's where your classical training and yes, theory came in absolutely. handy. absolutely. And you started working with Jimmy Wakely about that time too? Yeah, uh, he was one that told me to come out to the West Coast and leave Tulsa. Because he had a radio show mm -hmm. and he had some uh, traveling to do with uh, some personal appearances and stuff like that. And we found a, a very close bondage together. Oh. He sang quite a bit like Crosby. He sounds a lot like Bing Crosby when you when you hear him crooning. He, he had a good voice and it was well in tune. Oh, that's and funny. on his radio show, it was a half hour show, CBS, uh, we had some notable people. I remember in the rhythm section, we had Barney Kessel. Mm -hmm wonderful guitarist, had tall Paul Smith, who was Ella Fitzgerald's accompanist, oh. Paul Smith, wonderful pianist. And uh, he would just, Jimmy would just say, take, I'll give you five minutes of our show, pick out whatever tune you want and kick the heck out of it. Oh. And we had such fun doing that. You enjoyed yeah. working with him. Oh, yeah. Jimmy was responsible for my getting up with Lawrence Welk. How did that come about? I don't know. He had done a, a shot or two, a guest shot on the Welk show, mm -hmm. and uh, mentioned that he had a fiddle player that pals around with him that uh, Lawrence ought to be made aware of. And uh, Lawrence hired me sight unseen, well, I guess. You had a good referral, huh? Yeah, Jimmy was wonderful. Okay, you played with Spade Cooley. Spade and, Cooley, yeah. And Tex Williams, right? Yes. So what is Eastern Western? Yeah, it was kind of, it, it was like more orchestral. You know, the trumpets are all together in section, and the saxes were in section, mm -hmm. and the fiddles were in section. So that's and, what that term and, means. And Spade is a fiddle player, you remember. Uh-huh, uh -huh. And a pretty good one, too. Yeah. He played uh, country fiddle. Uh, and then you got into big band music too. Yeah, I started graduating into some of the heavier stuff. We went to the Ray Anthony show. It was a Plymouth television show. Uh huh. And uh, I remember that it was such a long day. We'd go to uh, the recording studio in the morning and tape the show all day. And then at the night, 
it was a package deal at the Palladium where we would have to play from nine to one in the evening that makes after very taping long. all day long. That was a long day. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you had a big band singer? A girl singer in that band named Ginny Mancini? Yes, yes! That was the gal that married Henry. That's right. And Ginny Mancini. Henry Mancini. Yes. So she started off her, her early days as a, as a girl singer. Right. Yeah. 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 You remember any memories, special memories from doing that show? I remember one. Uh -huh. I used to be so full of mischief. <laughs> I'm honest to God, I, I'm just full of mischief. Well, I still see that little twinkle and, in your eye. <laughs> and the contractor's name was Ben Barrett. And uh, they used to set up a big, long table with uh, rolls, mm -hmm. sweet rolls, mm -hmm. and some with all kinds of uh, cream over them, you know, mm -hmm. whipped cream mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and donuts mm -hmm. and bagels and cream cheese and locks mm -hmm. and a, a nice table and Ben Barrett used to get over there and find the biggest roll and the, the start right in grabbing right away for all the food before we had a chance to get near it. Aww. So one day I got there very early and they had a great big beautiful roll there that had I, I put shaving cream instead of whipped cream. Oh no! On all over it on a big You mom. little devil! And I knew that he was going to pick that one and he did! And the band was all watching and when he grabbed it and he took a big bite he went ah! It was fun. Uh, nobody ever snitched. <laughs> no, nobody told? No! Were loyal. No, oh, that's told. good. <laughs> I understand there was a guy named Noel Boggs who yeah. had a very musical bird. Wonderful Can steel guitar player. Uh, yeah, Eddie Noel Boggs. Yeah, we had to travel one time when I was with Wakely, and uh, we went through Washington and Oregon, and came back down through Idaho, and to come back down into California again, and we were traveling in his station wagon. And every time we had to get gas, he would have his gas card, you know, mm -hmm. and he'd stop at that kind of a station. And so I used to come up to the guy that was running the station and say, did Arthur tell you about this, you know, give him some other name. And then he'd give it this thing and said, Eddie Noel Boggs. He said, well, who's Arthur? You know, <laughs> and not want to charge the gas on him. Aww. And he said, you son of a gun, don't do that. Don't do that. Aww. It was just fun. And he had a musical bird? Yes. Uh, he, he used to sing, a, a, the bird used to sing tenderly. It was a minor bird, wasn't it? And with a wrong note. Aww. <laughs> you know? <laughs> with a wrong note in it, and it was so cute. And he used to get on the phone with everybody with the bird to do that for that's everybody. Cute. That's cute. Okay, besides playing live, yeah. you have a very impressive list of screen credits, and you've played on some of my very favorite television really? shows. Really? Which one? Like Green Acres, yeah. and Highway to Heaven, mm -hmm. and Little House on the Prairie. Yes. That, that must have been fun. That was great fun. <laughs> and you did a lot of movie soundtracks too. Yes, I did. I remember Jeremiah Johnson. Mm -hmm. Now that had a very interesting sound, didn't it? Yeah, a they lot of wanted flute and violin together. They wanted primitive, and it was like this. Did they just sort of describe in words what they wanted it to sound like? They just said primitive, and, and, but if you saw the film itself, and it was done so well, it was acted and mm -hmm. filmed mm -hmm. and scored beautifully, 
uh, you'd get the flavor. It, it, you couldn't miss what they were trying to prove. By by seeing what on they the were building. And yes. then you had to be creative yourself. To to add to yes. what they were building. And music is such a powerful part it is. of telling the story on screen, isn't it? It truly is. The soundtrack is such an important part. Yeah. I and just love it. You're responsible for that. Yeah. For creating that sound. So yeah. so when you I'm blessed. When you see these movies now, do you ever watch them again and, and remember? Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's a kick. It must give you a wonderful feeling to know that this music that you created those years ago yes. are still entertaining people now. My granddaughter keeps telling me that I made quite a few people happy. Well, you And you still are. <laughs> still that's the thing about music and putting it on, on film or recordings. They last forever. Yeah, they do. And continue to entertain people and, and uplift them and inspire them. Yeah, when I did Roots, that was 35 years ago. How was that, working with Quincy Jones? Oh, he... And Lou Gossett Jr.? And, and Lou Gossett was the fiddler, and that, I did all of the soundtrack for that. That was such a powerful, powerful miniseries, and the, the fiddling was such a, a, an integral part of that yes. soundtrack. Yeah, Lou. Lou thought I was, uh, I was able to clue him a little bit on how to look like he was really the fiddler. Because you, you gave him fiddling lessons yes, too, didn't yes. you? Yes, yes. The same thing, where, where you did the pre-record and then yeah. he practiced to the pre-record right. in order to look good We'd for the camera. We worked together on to make him look good. Did you become friends? Oh, well, I guess we did. I'm surprised that he remembered me so well. He remembers you very well. Isn't In it fact, beautiful? I saw Quincy Jones at Clive Davis's pre-Grammy party the other night, I... and he said to give you his love. Isn't that... Oh. Because you won an Emmy for that. Yes. For that score, right? Yes. And I understand that you actually wrote the piece that was played during the death scene. His death scene, yes. yes. Well, you know, I visited with Lou Gossett Jr. a few days ago. Yes. And he had some lovely comments to say about you. Isn't that lovely? You want to watch? Yes. Hey, Bobby. I haven't seen you in a while, but I wish you luck. I heard a lot about you, and this is for you to officially thank you for teaching me the fingering on the fiddle, you know, to make it look good. And uh, I pestered you a lot, but uh, I think you like the outcome. I want to thank you for your work and your continued success, and may God keep you and bless you. Thank you. Isn't that nice? Oh, that's sweet of him. He's quite a man. He really gives you credit for helping yes. him I'm, look like I'm he was thrilled. proficient. I'm just thrilled. <laughs> Honest. That's really nice. He's a very humble man, very sweet man. Yes. And and the fiddling was such an important part of that role. Yes, it was. It was his fiddling it truly that, was. that distracted everyone so that Kunta Kinte could escape. Yes. And then the last that scene... That scene, he was leaning, he's sitting against a tree mm -hmm. and somebody asked him to play something and he said, no man, he said, this is just, this is just for me. Yeah. And he plays this thing that I composed. Yes. Because as a slave he was always playing for everyone else. Everyone else. But this so he one said, this was one for him. him. And so that was Because he knew he was on his way out, you know. It, it, quite a scene. It's a beautiful scene. Yeah. It's a very touching and moving scene. Yeah. And the music was a very important part of that scene. Yes. Yes. If you've ever watched a film in in the rough cut before the soundtrack is added. Uh-huh. You really realize. Yes. Because music has the power to take whatever the emotion is. And carry you. And make it more intense. Oh, absolutely. Whether it's sad, whether it's joyful, whether it's happy, mournful, frightening, scary. Absolutely. It, it, it adds that extra dimension to carry it to that next level. Yeah. So what you do is a very important thing. By <laughs> <laughs> what you do too. Ah. You're quite a singer. Well, I understand also, besides all of the soundtrack work, that you had a great, great career as a session player working with some very famous recording artists. Oh, yes. You want to tell us some of them? Oh. Frank Sinatra, for one. Yeah, I did that. You worked with Marvin Hamlish, too. Yes, you? I did. Uh, Do you remember what you worked on together? Uh, Pennies from Heaven. Oh my Remember that picture? Yes. I did the uh, 
credits for the opening and the closing of that picture. Did it in one take. Really? Just, and wow. they were shooting the the film itself and they had the coins coming down. So I'd, uh, you know, uh, while I'm playing Pennies from, uh-huh. from Heaven, you add that to it. Well, that was my cartoon experience, experience. and my vaudeville experience. With the improvisational yeah. skills. So Is I got a double scale to... for it. Wow, yeah. that's impressive. Yeah. So, so tell us more about the cartoons. Like, if they needed a special sound, sound like a, a door creaking. Yeah. Then... <laughs> you know. So they would, you would see what was happening, and you would have to invent the and sound. Invent the sound, yeah. That must have been fun. Oh, it was. It was great fun. <laughs> Double scale didn't hurt either. That didn't hurt a darn thing. <laughs> that made it even more fun. That's right. <laughs> and you worked on Funny Girl? Yeah, I did three different versions of it. There was a 1914, 19... And there was some flapper music in there, wasn't there? Yeah, uh-huh. there was 1914, 1926 or so, and 1941. And uh, so it was three different kinds of music. That must have been fun. I almost can remember the writer's name, the composer. Starts with an S. I can't remember it. And you worked on The Sting? The Sting, yeah. Yes. So do you um, have any memories of being in the studio working on those? No, they, they were so one after the other. You were in such demand. Yes. I, I do two or three a day. And with Quincy, he had you contracting and hiring the musicians. Yes, didn't he? I was hiring the orchestra. So he had great trust in, in your abilities. Yeah, well, that paid pretty good, you yes. know. But I'll tell you one thing that was interesting about that. Mm-hmm. We were doing the first couple of hours of Roots, and it starts in Africa. Mm hmm. And it works its way into America, but they used African instruments. And Quincy called, I believe it was a university in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Their music department had all these unheard of African instruments. And Quincy wanted to have them shipped over to LA and I had to try to find people who could play these instruments, and that was really hard to oh, find. Oh, I can imagine, because yeah. they didn't exist anymore. So they hardly were... existed, and their names of them, you have to sneeze. <laughs> you <know? laughs> but he wanted it realistic. Yes, he wanted it realistic. And authentic to the, to the time. And it kept me hopping a lot on the phone. And he shared his Emmy with you. You, yeah. you shared the Emmy for that. Yes. For, for Roots. It wasn't that nice. How was it like to win an award like that? Oh, I, I, I never felt like I uh, really, I thought I lucked out, that's all. You know? Oh, you're, you're true talent. Yeah. True talent will always rise to the top. Uh, and and I, I think what is very amazing is that very few musicians can actually make a living all their life. Yeah, that amen. A musician. It's Usually hard. At, at some point they have to take a day job, so to speak. Yeah. But you really have made a, li- a living all your so entire life. I have so lucky and so blessed, honest to God. Doing, doing what you love. Doing what I love. It yeah. gets me young. Yes. So how did you meet Henry Mancini and start working on his films? Was it through David Rose? Possibly, they're good friends. Mm-hmm. Because you In did. In fact, Henry used to say about David Rose that poor guys only had three shows, <laughs> and every one of them lasted fifteen years. You know, <laughs> Little House on the Prairie, Father uh-huh. Murphy, oh, uh-huh. you know, Highway to Heaven, Highway to Heaven, yeah. all uh-huh. those things. Yeah. He said the poor guys only had three shows. <laughs> but if the if they're the right three shows, yeah, yes, it's okay, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So you did the Pink Panther? Yeah, yes. I, I worked some of that with him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Oklahoma Crew. Now I understand yeah. there's some pretty funny stories about that. We flew 
to Oklahoma, to Norman, Oklahoma, uh -huh. there was a big football game, and uh -huh. it, it happens every year between OU and Nebraska, uh -huh. and they shut the state down. The lieutenant governors are there, all the notables are there, and they had built, it was for Oklahoma crude, a miniature oil derrick. And Henry stood up on the top of that oil derrick and conducted a maybe a hundred and twenty five piece blow band, you know, oh they my. they're blowing their butt off as uh -huh. and one lousy piddle. You Yeah. And I played Oklahoma Crude at the halftime for for uh, OU. Oh what a great experience. And we stayed in or in Norman, Oklahoma, which is I bet that that stadium was all cheering. Oh my gosh! I went my, I went down to where the football players were for just a minute. Uh -huh. My God, I'm six foot, and I was just a midget oh. compared to those guys. They were huge. They're like trucks. Now, did they have your fiddle mic? Yeah, they had it really mic good. Because it was televised uh, for the yeah. halftime show. Yeah, they they had it, and it came out real good. You have a lot of fun times on the road, don't you? Oh, God, yes. And the camaraderie and the teamwork yeah. of playing in a band. Yeah. Because you've worked with so many famous people and celebrities and stars. Yeah, but, but most of them are just folks. Yes, and it's interesting that the, the moment that you pick out is, is a time that you were all being challenged by something together and you yeah. survive it. And, yeah. And it's the, the teamwork and the band. It's the same thing when I was in the Marines. Yes. You know? Yes. Same Your thing. Your buddies. Yeah. I got your back. You betcha. You say we go play a little music right now. Yes, that let's sound do good that. To you? I okay. love it. All right. This is a song that you play at a lot of the temples. Yes. How nice that you share your craft and your beautiful I, talent. I changed the chords in some of this from the original version to make it a little bit more modern, but I I tried to keep its original beauty. If I can, I hope you like it. It's called Hebrew Melody. Get me into it if you can. <laughs> 